It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger. But nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature, so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. People realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate, the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. People living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street listening to music, and at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking, and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side, and a few hours later, another. So you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. 
Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon, and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. Then the night comes and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines, and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. A new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes. People decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. Moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the moon. This means that the forces holding the moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The moon won't hit us. It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path. All the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world. So imagine being one of the first people sent to explore Mars. As you're approaching the red planet, something strange and creepy draws your attention. There, yes, right there. Doesn't it look like a mammoth bear's head? What or who could possibly create a bear snout in the middle of a crater? Unfortunately, or should I say luckily, there's nothing mysterious about the bear's head. It's just a facial pareidolia. That's a tendency to see facial features in everyday things. Hmm. But speaking about the finding on Mars, should we rename the phenomenon into bearidolia? You could see that coming, couldn't you? All right, check it out. You see a V-shaped hill that looks like a nose. Then there are two craters that look like eyes. And then there's a circular fracture pattern, the head, 
that surrounds the nose and the eyes. Experts think that the face could be created when a deposit was settling over a buried impact crater. And the nose might be a mud or volcanic vent with solidified lava or mud flows around it. Anyway, the crater does look like a bear's face, I'll give you that. But thanks to HiRISE, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, another of NASA's amazing acronyms, we've seen many other crazy craters on the red planet. Like smiley faces, a bird, or an elephant. First, let's have a look at the famous face of Mars. These images were first taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. At that time, the resolution was obviously quite poor, plus the lighting was slanted which produced the result that shocked people in the 1970s – a face carved of rock staring back at Earth. Did it mean there was another civilization on Mars that had created this monument? Nah. Look at the photo of the same spot taken by the current Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The resolution is much, much better, and the face has miraculously turned into an ordinary hill. Or look at this teeny Bigfoot, whose image was captured in 2008. I say teeny because this creature is just a few inches tall. And when the photo was taken, Bigfoot was only several yards away from the camera. And here, one curious soul zoomed in on a small rock and spotted something that resembled a gorilla. That's how some people started to believe there were apes on Mars. Yeah, really. Let me show you some more examples of imaginary creatures and faces on the red planet. Most of them come from a series of images taken by the Themis camera. Currently, it's on board the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which only needs two hours to orbit the red planet, carrying some important scientific instruments. Let me introduce my happy Martian to you. This two-mile-wide crater was photographed in 2008. The next crater chain looks like a wasp, with its wispy wings of impact debris. The whole feature was probably created by a meteorite that fell at a very low angle and broke into pieces right before the impact. Now, do you see a woolly mammoth or an elephant here? Lava flows in one region on Mars left this image on its reddish soil. The region itself, called Elysium Planitia, is famous for the planet's youngest lava flows. For example, the one that looks like a mammoth most likely formed in the past 100 million years. Eh, just yesterday. Now let's talk about love. Or rather, its symbol, the heart. Do you like these two hearts on the surface of the red planet? This one is actually a mesa top outlined by frost. And this heart shape is an impact crater. The hit tore away dark surface material and exposed lighter soil underneath. Then some of the material probably flew downslope, creating the heart. And this dust-covered hummingbird. Can you see its long beak and head? Scientists aren't sure how this shape was formed, but they think erosion and wind played a part in its creation. These dark sand dune deposits look like a howling wolf. And here, can you see a series of interlocking gears? This image looks like the letter T, right? The right angle fracture was created by the tectonic stretching of the Martian crust. Do you think we might find other letters of the alphabet on Mars too? Why not? And now, how about another bizarre thing astronomers noticed on the surface of Mars? Is that a door to someone's house? It was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. It became viral because this formation over here, see, looks like a door. Unfortunately, scientists, due to their rational minds, were quick to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There were several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, the opening is tiny, a mere 3 feet high. They're sure that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. If you look at the rock closely, you may notice strata. Those are layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And look at this! See those cracks? That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight. And this created the door-shaped opening. This theory is quite plausible, because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. 
It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago. But it's not only the red planet that can boast of having unusual formations. Let's take this comet, for example. This image was taken by the European spacecraft Rosetta in 2014. Can you see a face on its right-hand side? Or the moon? Here's its famous rabbit. It sits upside down, with its ears pointing downward. Some people see a man on the moon. It can either be his face or the entire body. If someone sees the whole human figure, it usually looks like it's carrying sticks. Sometimes it's a toad. To spot it, look at the top left-hand side of our moon. The toad is facing upward, see? Now look at this spinning neutron star. Such a star is a collapsed core of a supergiant star with a total mass of 10 to 25 solar masses. Except for black holes and some hypothetical objects, like quark stars or white holes, neutron stars are the densest and smallest known stellar objects. Anyway, back to this particular star. As you can see, this space object, located 17,000 light-years away from Earth, is surrounded by a cloud of energetic particles. And this image, taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, appeared in 2009 and became viral in no time. All because many people spotted a hand-like structure among all that space stuff. NASA explained that the star was spinning incredibly fast, spewing energy into the space surrounding it. This created intriguing and complex structures, like the large cosmic hand so many people see. Now, look at the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation Orion. This is a freezing cold and dark cloud of dust and gas that was first noted in 1888. This dark shadowing is created by dust. And at the base of the nebula, there are many bright spots. Those are young stars at the stage of formation. Pay attention to this extremely bright star in the top left side of the horse head. Its radiation is so powerful that the star is starting to erode the cloud around itself. It means that, in millions of years, the nebula might not resemble the head of a horse anymore. Well, I won't be around then. The European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope has captured an image in which we can see the collision of three different galaxies. We can even observe the effect they have on each other. But the coolest thing is that, while colliding, they created a recognizable shape. Because doesn't it look like a giant space hummingbird? Have you ever wondered why all planets are perfectly round? And what if these celestial bodies decided to break the rules and change their shape? Would we end up with square planets, triangular moons, or maybe even intergalactic shapes we can't even imagine? Well, let's find out. So how do planets form in the first place? The universe is filled with swirling clouds of dust and gas. These clouds, called molecular clouds, consist of various elements and compounds, such as hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, and so on. They're like a cosmic kitchen filled with the ingredients needed to cook up some brand new planets. The first step in the recipe for planetary formation is called the accretion theory. Let's say that something happens that causes gravitational instability, like a supernova goes off nearby or something. This pushes the gas and dust in the cloud and causes them to come together. Because of gravity, these particles start falling toward a central point. They become more tightly packed together, like when you squeeze a ball in your hand. And eventually, they're squeezed so hard that the cloud starts to flatten into a disk shape, kind of like when you mix flour and water to make pizza dough. This disk is called a protoplanetary disk. It's also spinning because the cloud's particles had some rotation to begin with. Now, imagine these tiny dust particles and gas molecules dancing around in the disk. Sometimes, they bump into each other. And when they do, they stick together like Velcro. These little clumps of dust and gas are called planetesimals. They're the building blocks of planets. And as the planetesimals continued to collide and merge, they grew larger and larger, forming protoplanets. The protoplanets were getting serious about their size, and their gravity became stronger. Some of them got so massive that they became the grand masters of their cosmic neighborhoods, the planets we know and love. Each planet had its own unique recipe of gases, rocks, and sometimes even water. But why do the planets look like spheres? Well, it's all because of gravity. Let's go back to our protoplanets. Imagine you're squeezing a balloon with your hands. The air inside of the balloon pushes back, creating pressure. 
something similar happens with planets. Gravity squeezes its material inward, pulling in towards the center. And since gravity acts equally in all directions, it pulls material from all sides toward the center of mass, resulting in a sphere-like shape. And that material pushes back with pressure, resisting the force of gravity. In the end, they both find a sweet spot where they balance each other out. It's called hydrostatic equilibrium, a fancy term that means everything inside a planet is in balance. But that's not all. Another thing that makes the planet spherical is their rotation. Think about a ball of Play-Doh or something like that. Imagine you spin it rapidly. The material starts to push outward, making the Play-Doh bulge at the equator and flatten at the poles. The same thing happens to planets. As they spin on their axes, the combination of gravity and rotation pushes the material outward, making the planet bulge at the equator. They low-key want to become disks again. However, gravity doesn't want any lumpy planets. It wants them to be nice and round. So it keeps pulling on the material, trying to make everything as compact as possible. Eventually, gravity wins, and the planet settles into a spherical shape. Let's take some examples from our planetary playlist. Jupiter, the giant of the solar system, loves to show off its ablateness. It spins so fast that it becomes noticeably squished at the poles and chubby in the middle. It's like a spinning top with a cute belly. Saturn, the ringed wonder, also joins the oblate party. It spins around with its beautiful rings, and its ablateness is even more pronounced than Jupiter's. These examples show how rotation can give planets a unique shape. They go from being perfectly round to having a delightful bulge around the middle. It's like cosmic pottery, where the spinning motion creates a playful and distinct shape. So now you know why the planets are round. But what's more interesting is, what if they weren't? What if they were, let's say, cubical, or even triangular? Well, let's see. A cube-shaped or a triangle-shaped planet would have its mass spread out in a completely different way than a sphere, and you know what that means? Gravity would be all shook up too. On a spherical planet, gravity pulls everything towards the center because the mass is evenly distributed around that center. But when we introduce a cube-shaped or triangle-shaped planet, things get interesting. If you're standing at the center of one of those faces, you'd feel the strongest pull of gravity. That's because the faces are the closest to the center of gravity, and as you venture away from the center and start walking towards the edges, gravity starts playing tricks on you. You would feel the struggle against the steep angled gravity. Walking on those edges would feel just like climbing a mountain, or walking on a super steep slope, all because gravity wants you right in the middle of the face and nowhere else. Now imagine the terrain along the edges and corners. It's a barren, rocky, and dry landscape. Why? Well, all the water would pool in at the center of each face, leaving the edges high and dry. And the air quality? Well, it's either non-existent or so thin that it can't support life. Not the coziest place to set up camp, that's for sure. And don't forget your warm clothes, lunch, and hiking boots. You'll need them because of the crazy climate. The type of climate you'll encounter on our cube or triangle-shaped Earth depends on how it spins. If it rotates at its corners, each side would enjoy a mild, temperate climate. However, if it rotates on an axis through two of its faces, things get intense. Picture a roller coaster version of our current climate. Some faces would be polar wonderlands, icy and chilly. The top and bottom faces for the cube, and the bottom face for the triangle. Meanwhile, the other sides would be completely different. In a cube, they would be scorching hot with an equatorial climate that would make you break a sweat. Instead of sunlight gently curving along the surface, it would directly beam onto these faces. Talk about feeling the heat. And on a triangular planet, the sunlight would strike the faces at an angle. This angled sunlight would create fascinating temperature variations across the planet. Imagine this: as you move from the base of the triangle towards the tip, the temperatures would gradually decrease. The base, where the sunlight hits most directly, would be the hottest region, just like the equatorial climate we're familiar with on our spherical Earth. But as you venture towards the tip, the angle of sunlight would be less direct, leading to cooler temperatures. But the base is still super cold and dark, since the sunlight doesn't directly reach it. So the triangle would be absolutely crazy in terms of temperature changes and climate zones. By the way, you know that cozy blanket of air we call the atmosphere? Well. On our angular Earth, things would get a little topsy-turvy. 
gravity would be pulling stronger from the center of each face. The result? The atmosphere would go through some crazy changes. Picture this. At the center of each face, where gravity is strongest, the atmosphere would gather and thicken. It would be like a bustling city, full of air molecules. But as you venture towards the edges, things would start to thin out. The atmosphere would become scarce and very thin. So breathing along the edges would be quite a challenge, and the edges would be a tough neighborhood for life to thrive. Moreover, a thinner atmosphere means less protection from the sun's radiation and solar winds, so corners and edges would be extremely dangerous for humans. Of course, this is all just a playful exploration of what could be. Our Earth loves its spherical shape, and that's a good thing. But there's no harm in imagining wild and wonderful possibilities. So keep your imagination soaring and continue to marvel at the marvels of our amazing planet, however it may be shaped. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.